I'm here with two great guys, uh, Michael and Dion, and we're here at Salesforce.com, the cloud conference, and we just heard the announcement about Chatter. So I'd love to get your guys' take on Chatter. What, you, what do you think that means for the enterprise, for employees, for Enterprise 2.0? Love to get your take on this. Sure, so it, I think it's very significant that the first major announcement here at, at, uh, at Dreamforce was, uh, was Chatter, which is essentially a Twitter slash Facebook for the enterprise. So it has you know, enterprise class sensibilities around security. Uh, and what's very interesting is that uh, it's uh, uh, going to be part of the Salesforce platform. Uh, folks who already have it today are now going to have essentially social features that allow them to, to share and communicate and collaborate. But all of the 135,000 plus Force.com apps can now add social features. And so hmm. we're starting to see this really emerging as, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm calling it the social operating system. Now we've seen this with SharePoint 2010. It's really an applications platform that has social features built into it. Uh, and these are ideal on-ramps for you know, companies that have intranets and portals uh, to provide a, now a consistent social experience. At least that's where it seems to be heading. So I, I don't think it's a small discussion. Uh, and some people might think that, uh, that uh, Salesforce is late to the, the social game. You know, IBM and Oracle and Microsoft have been doing this for years and there's now dozens of startups now finally Salesforce comes, but I think that uh, they bring a certain credibility um, and I think you know, the, the strategic vision of this announcement, and you correct me uh, uh, if you think otherwise, uh, Michael, shows how important this is. So I think it's a you know, market validation more than anything else. Absolutely, this is all about credibility and validation. From an enterprise 2.0 perspective, sure, there have been many startups that have tried to integrate social computing and social networking tools into the enterprise. However, when a company the size of Salesforce makes a strategic push and starts enabling its various applications in, a, in an integrated and a deep way to support social computing, yes, Enterprise 2.0 comes of age. And we're seeing it here. Now, what do you think this is going to do, let's say, to employees? So as an analyst, I, I use a lot of the social platforms. Obviously, I've been crowned the queen of SCRM, social CRM. It's mostly because there are not enough girls. Paul Greenberg does not look good in a dress. Um, but I find it a bit overwhelming, but I also find it necessary. So what do you think about how is this going to change our daily work life? Do companies really understand what they're asking us to do when they ask us to to participate in Enterprise 2.0, and what do you think about the change management pieces to this? So, uh, so that's a lot of questions, and so I'll, I'll, I'll take <laughs> yeah, a couple so we'll, of them. We need three hours. <laughs> and let Michael take the rest. But uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, especially senior people in an organization, do they have time to engage socially with the rest of their organization? This is a big question we have with social tools in general, and social CRM, as you know, is how do you talk to millions of your constituents? They want right. to have a conversation with you, but they greatly outnumber you. Uh, and I do think we have to find means of making it efficient. That I do see that organizations that have people that, that don't have much of a cognitive surplus anymore, I mean, they're already maxed in their schedules. They don't have a place to fit this in um, if they look at it that way. They say, I have to find more time to do this. Uh, when they look at it, this can really save me time in my communication, that I can make a lot more of what people want from me self-service. I can put my thoughts out there, and they're not going to bug me and want to talk to me. They might be able to get the information they need. Uh, so while I don't think the evidence is completely in, um, I think that uh, organizations that do have workers that are pushed to, to the max are going to have some adoption challenges, uh, whereas organizations are really, you know, are, are properly staffed and, and more reasonably managed. Um, might be able to, uh, to use these a little bit better. So I don't know, what do you think, Michael? You know, uh, going into the keynote, I was talking with an analyst, and his comment was regarding social, social computing in general. He said, you know, if I work in a company and I've paid my dues and I've you know, spent time and I've gotten education and so forth, and now you ask me to start sharing all that information with Mm. And I start spending my time doing this, that helps you, and it hurts me. Because now I'm now spending all of this time giving you my trade secret, so to speak. Well, this is what I got, was like, because I'm one of the top tweeters at Forrester, and so they said, well, why don't you teach everybody else what you're doing, which I'm more than happy to do, but then my role is different. Am I the teacher of other analysts, 
or am I the top CRM social media customer service tweeter? And I don't know that I could do both really well. Yeah. Well, there's this whole question about you know the altruism that may be required for this, or is it self-interest? Is it is it our self-interest to actually share knowledge, or do we have to only do it for you know because we're trying to help others? Uh, one thing I do think we have to realize is that our companies are paying us to share what, what we know, right? Yes. Um, and, and there's, Theoretically. There's, you know, there is, well, Theoretically. There, there, is, there is an employment contract of some kind there, but it's not usually explicitly stated, right? You, know, you, really, you know, how much are you really required to help? Uh, what we really see is, in general, social computing works better when there's more self-interest involved. People won't tag knowledge for other people, but they'll tag it for themselves so they can find it again, but that ends up helping everyone. Right. So there, there are some things, you know, if you look at for, if we look at the patterns inside these tools, uh, the ones that really promote self, in, you know, enlightened self-interest locally, uh, but it ends up benefiting the entire organization, those often work better. I think that, I think that's, you know, part of our path uh, uh, through thinking through these things. You, you know, uh, Diane mentioned the word locally, and I think this is a very important point, because when you make a, a kind of broad theoretical pronouncement that thou shalt now share information, it, it's so abstract it becomes almost meaningless. However, if you look on a particular project, and you're a project manager, and you tell your team, I want you to share information about this, that, or the other thing, because that's going to make you efficient, or if you're the IT department, you say to them, you know, we've got to have a closer connection back to the line of business users, because we're building an application that needs to support them, and here are some tools to help you collaborate and do that together. I, I would say having been an engineer and been a project manager at Hughes, so I had you know 200 people, which is not really a team, it's a village, um, and a $20 million budget, I would say absolutely I would have loved this kind of software. Um, but I can definitely see that it, you definitely are going to change what you do on a daily basis. It's but, different. But the world is moving this way. Yes. This is an inevitable tide. The tide of collaboration being facilitated by new software and new technologies, this is not going away. So I think successful companies will be the ones who recognize that a transition does need to be made, but they need to make this transition in, in a systematic and an orderly manner, not just let it happen in, in an ad hoc, hodgepodge kind of way. I know you were talking to Brett a little bit about filters. What do you guys think about so I can just see this, this fire hose of information coming at you. And I think that's what I'm concerned about is that I feel like I have a fire hose with no filter right now. And so I, I'm, you know, obviously drink the Kool-Aid about social. I love it. I think it's amazing. I'm a natural collaborator, so I'm really excited. But I think the idea of filter and how do you make this stuff useful? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, the uh, information abundance is, is one of the consequences of this. And, but it becomes overload that's a problem. And you know, Clay Shirky has that, that famous quote, it's not information overload that's the problem, it's filter failure. Mm. And so you know, if we, don't, if we want that information, we, we need to surface what our, our workers know, what our customers know, uh, and that helps us do a much better job than we could have otherwise. Uh, but a, a lot of that information isn't immediately useful, so how do we cut it down to something that is useful? And I, in fact, I was just uh, uh, writing on EBISQ about this, the three waves of Enterprise 2.0. First one's information explosion, then there's filter, uh, there's enterprise information filtering. Uh, that's not good enough because it isn't really strategic. It doesn't tell us what we actually know. It just cuts down the information and hopefully does a good job. Uh, and that's where things like business intelligence and really mm. strategically saying, now that we can actually see everything, we can begin to make sense of this and we can understand trends and, and be able to do real analysis on this. And, and that summarizes things in a way that we can now begin manage. So I think do you really think there's a new role emerging here and we're at about nine minutes? Um, so maybe we need to... Uh to wrap this one up and start another one, but I almost see a new role coming, is that someone's gonna be the person who's gonna look at the firehose and help us figure out, kind of like a, a BI, maybe business intelligence, business analytics person who's gonna be the, the filter person. Somebody's gotta look at it. Knowledge management. This is what knowledge management ah. will actually end up doing, I think. Uh, and it's interesting, we look at Connotate and IBM's new smart cloud, you know, they have they plug in all everything what you know, and then you can of course lay in you know, everything that's in your social uh, uh, computing ecosystem. So you know, it's interesting, but it's early days. We're all trying to figure out what that stack is going to look like and roles and responsibilities. Did you ever hear of something called Boolean searching? Yeah. 
<laughs> so what's needed is a combination of simple techniques to filter and, and sort and slice and dice all of this information combined with somebody who plays that content role that you just described. You need both. You need the capability and you need the person who will help slice and dice and build the taxonomies and hopefully do it easy, easy in an easy way. That makes sense. Well, I'm gonna... let, me, let me say that the tools should make it easy. Right. Tools That's are implicitly somehow implying that they will help us. Well, we're at 10 minutes, so I'm going to end this one. But I think there's a bigger conversation here, so we'll do part two in a second.